Welcome. This is Coach Dorf. We're going to continue our discussion about calculus. Today, we're going to talk about the mean value theorem. Before we get into the mean value theorem, though, we're going to talk about a preliminary theorem called Rolle's theorem. So here are the conditions of Rolle's theorem. You have a function f, and you have that the function is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, that f is also differentiable on the open interval from a to b, and that f of a equals f of b. So let's look at some examples of what this might look like. Uh, if I have a function, the graph of a function that looks like this, this would satisfy Rolle's theorem. Here's my a value, here's my b value, and notice that f of a here, f of a is going to equal f of b. Um, I could also have another function, let's say I have a function that looks like this. All right, here's my a, here's my b. And it's a continuous function. It's a differentiable. There's no corners. Okay. I'm going to go over again. Welcome, this is Coach Dorf. We're gonna continue our discussion about calculus. Today, we're gonna to talk about the mean value theorem. Before we get into the mean value theorem, which is a very important theorem in, in calculus, we're gonna talk about a preliminary theorem called Rolle's theorem. Here are the conditions of Rolle's theorem. Let f be a function that is continuous on a closed interval from A to B. Uh, also let f be differentiable on the open interval from A to B and let f of A equal f of B. Remember, f is continuous on A, B, you, you can think of that as mean, meaning that I can draw the graph of f without lifting my pencil. And if f is differentiable, that means that it's continuous, which we already have in part A, but also that um, it's not going to have any corners or cusp, and it won't have any vertical tangents. So let's just look at some uh, images of some possible functions that could be satisfying the conditions of Rolle's theorem. So I could have a function, a graph of a function that looks like this. Okay, where here is x equals a, and here is x equals b. Um, and we notice that the graph of my function doesn't have any corners or, or cusps, no vertical tangents, so it's differentiable. It's definitely continuous because I was able to draw it. And the the f of a value equals the f of b value. That's That's saying that this... Um, here I'll mark it in red so it's easier to see here, that this point has the same y value as this point. All right, here's another uh, possible example of a function that would work. Let's see, okay. Um, let's suppose I have a function that looks like this. All right, there's my x of a. There's my x of b. My graph of my function is continuous there. I was able to draw that without lifting it up. So the function is continuous from a to b. It's also differentiable, no, no corners or cusps. And the value, again, of um, f of a, there's f of a point and there's f of b. Those have the same y value there. So um, it works. So when I have those conditions, what are the result, the result of the um, Rolle's theorem? Well, it says then there is a uh, number x equals c, where x is be where c is between a and b, such that the derivative at c equals zero. All right. So what does that mean in terms of our graphs here? We'll go back to the blue graph. Um, if the derivative at a value c equals zero, that means that the slope of the tangent line is equal to zero. So it's a horizontal tangent line. Well, that happens like right here. There's my horizontal line. So there's the derivative at c equals zero. And the c value is going to be right there. There's x equals c. All right. So Rolle's theorem tells me that there is this number c somewhere between a and b. 
so that if I took the derivative of, of the function um, at that point C, then I would get the derivative equal to zero. So the tangent line is horizontal. If I look at the um, my second example there, I can see that, well, I got a horizontal tangent line there, and I've got one here, and I've got one here. And so there's actually going to be several C values. I'll call them C1, C2, C3, that all work. Um, that the derivative C1 equals zero, the derivative at C2 equals zero, and the derivative at C3 equals zero. You get horizontal tangent lines there. The so Rolle's theorem says there is at least one. There could be more than one, as we see in the second example here. There were three, um, but there's at least one that works. Okay, let's look at a specific example of this with a, a specific function. So we're going to let f equal the sine function. And we're going to be on the interval from negative pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. So what's the graph of the sine function look like? Well, it goes to the origin, and it's like a wave here, going up and down, like that. And let's put in some values here. Uh, this point here is pi over 2. Here we have 3 pi over 2. Here we have negative pi over 2. Uh, and so I'm looking at the interval we said here from negative pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. So I'm going from here up like this down to there. That's that's my function on the interval that we, we have. Now, does that satisfy the conditions of Rolle's theorem? Okay. Conditions of Rolle's theorem. Theorem, okay. So those are, um, F is continuous on negative pi over two to three pi over two. Yep, that's true. F is differentiable on that open interval from negative pi over two to three pi over two. Yep, that's true. And F of negative pi over two equals F of three pi over two. Well, let's check this one. Let's see. So F of pi over two is equal to the sine of pi over two, I'm sorry, negative pi over two, um, which is negative one. And F of three pi over two equals the sine of three pi over two, which is also equal to negative one. And so these are equal. So the third condition of Rolle's theorem are, are correct. Okay, so then what do we have? So the result, there is uh, some x equals c, where c is going to be between pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2, such that the derivative at c equals 0. All right, so what, where, what is C? Well, let's take the derivative of that. So F is sine of X. So that means the derivative is going to be cosine of X. And when does cosine of X equal zero? So when is cosine of X equal to zero? Well, that works for an infinite number of values, but one of those is pi over two. And pi over 2 is between negative pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And on our graph, remember, we have that. Here's, here's our pi over 2. If I go up here and I look at that, there is the tangent line. Okay, so the derivative at pi over 2 equals 0, right? So we have back here, we have the derivative of, of, of sine. So the derivative of that is cosine. And the derivative at pi over 2 is going to equal to cosine of pi over 2, which equals 0. And 
So that means C equals pi over two. Are there any other values um, between negative pi over two and three pi over two? Um, any of those C values that work? There aren't. Okay, there are some other C values that work, but they're not between negative pi over two and three pi over two. All right, so let's look at a second example here. All right, um, suppose I have this function, f of x is this polynomial, x cubed minus two x squared minus four x plus two, and, and we're on the interval from negative two to two. And we're supposed to, um, uh, here, find the value of C that satisfies Rolle's theorem. Okay, so what do I do? For first of all, I have to check that F satisfies. Rolle's theorems um, and hypotheses, okay, which are again um, one f is continuous on uh, negative two to two, and then the second one f is differentiable on the open interval from negative two to two, and f of negative two equals f of two. So let's check these. Well, is f continuous? Yeah, my function f is a polynomial and polynomials are always continuous. So we're good there. f is differentiable. Yep, because it's a polynomial again, it's uh, differentiable. And f of negative two equals f of two. Well, let's check that. What's f of negative two? So I'm gonna put negative two into the function. So I get negative two cubed times two times negative two squared minus four times negative two plus two. Uh, that's gonna equal negative eight. Um, and sorry, I got put a three there, I meant negative two. Uh, then I have negative two squared, which is four times uh, negative two is gonna be a negative eight. And then I've got negative four times a negative two, which would be plus eight and then plus two. And that's gonna be then equal to negative six. So now let's look at f of two. So I've got two cubed minus two times two squared minus four times two plus two. So I've got eight minus uh, two squared is four times uh, negative two would be minus eight there. And then I have a minus eight plus two and that also equals negative six. And these are equal. So the third condition of Rolle's theorem works. All right, so now uh, find C. Well, how would I find C? And I do that by take the derivative of it. So what's the derivative here? Um, again, my function, well, let me redo this here. Rewrite my function. My function f of x is x cubed minus two x squared minus four x plus two. So the derivative is gonna be three x squared minus four x minus four. Um, and so what I need to do is I want to um, set that equal to zero because Rolle's theorem says the C value is gonna equal zero. And now we're gonna factor this. So when I factor this, I'm gonna have a three X and an X here. The, and it will be a plus two and a minus two. And I can check this. So three X times X, oops, three X times X gives me three uh, X squared. A three X minus two gives me minus six X. A two, uh, times x is positive two x, and a two times a negative two is negative four, and that equals three x uh, minus four x minus four, so it checks. Okay, so I've got that the derivative equals three x plus two uh, 
times x minus two, and that's going to equal zero because Rolle's theorem we want to find the values for where the derivative equals zero. So that means three x plus two equals zero, which then if I solve for x, uh, bringing the two over to the other side, get a minus two, and dividing by three, I get a minus two thirds. And x minus two equals zero. Bring the x to the other side, get x equals two. So which one of these are within the interval? My interval, so is the interval um, from negative two to two. Well, there's got to be at least one of these, and that one works. X equals negative two thirds. Um, is so notice that negative two thirds is between there. So c equaling negative two thirds works. Okay. What about two? X equals two. Does that work? Does that work? Um, so note x equals two does not work. because it's not, because it is not in the interval from negative two to positive two um, with an open bracket. If it had been a closed bracket, it would work, but not in an open bracket, because, because that x equals two is um, um, the end of that endpoint there. So my answer is here, Okay, so uh, C equals negative two thirds is my answer there. All right, let me do one more example of this. Uh, so now we're gonna let F equal X to the two thirds on the interval from negative one to one. Okay, suppose that we just go ahead and I just say, well, okay, let's just go ahead and take the derivative and do um, Rolle's theorem. So the derivative here is going to equal, by the power rule, I bring the two thirds out front. I subtract one from the exponent. So two thirds minus one is a minus one third. And now since I have a negative exponent there, I can write that as two thirds times one over X to the positive exponent. So it's, it's like two over three X to the one third. And Rolle's theorem would say that um, F, that that derivative equals zero, that would imply then that two over three X to the one third equals zero. But wait a minute, that doesn't work, right? Because if, if a fraction equals zero, that means that the numerator of the fraction has to be zero, but it's a two and two doesn't, doesn't work. So this doesn't work, okay? So what's wrong? Well, we didn't check the, um, the hypotheses of Rolle's theorem. We didn't check those. Check the hypotheses of Rolle's theorem. What are those hypotheses again? Okay, well, uh, the, the function has to be continuous, it has to be differentiable, and that the endpoints have to equal each other. Well, let's look at the graph of this. Um, so let's see, go back here. And I will share, oops, I bring this up here and bring up Desmos. Okay. So this works. Okay. So now you see, this is the graph here of our function X to the two thirds. We well, can see that the function is continuous. It's but it's not differentiable at the origin there. There's a cusp or point there, okay? That's the problem there. That's why we can't get some, there's nowhere on here where the derivative of the function is gonna be a, is gonna have a slope zero, okay? Um, the derivative is never gonna equal zero. I'm not gonna get a tangent line that's horizontal here. Okay, so let's go back to um, my iPad here. Right, so um, the problem is F is not differentiable 
at x equals zero. Because the graph again, try to draw the graph. What we saw on on Desmos, the graph looks like this. So here's y equals x to the two thirds, and at there, um, f is not differentiable at x equals zero. So we can't use so so can't use Rolle's theorem. All right, so there's the background on Rolle's theorem. Now, this was a preliminary thing. Now we're going to get to the main idea, and this is the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem is more general than Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem is a special case of the mean value theorem. And you'll see that in a second as we talk about these things. So um, what do we have here for the mean value theorem? Given we have a function, just like we did in Rolle's theorem, And in this case, we have two conditions. We have f is continuous on the closed interval from A to B, and f is differentiable on the open interval from A to B. That's it. OK, so notice how this is different than um, Rolle's theorem. In Rolle's theorem, we have a third condition, and that third condition is f of A equals f of B. We don't need it for the mean value theorem. All right. and then. The result we get looks a little bit more complicated, but it is um, it covers more cases than we get with Rolle's theorem. So in here, so like Rolle's theorem, there is a number x equals c. Oh, sorry, that was a mistake there. There's my c, where uh, c is between a and b, just like in, in Rolle's theorem, such that, and now here's where it's different. The derivative, it doesn't equal zero, but it's going to equal f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Um, so, so no, what is that on that right-hand side there? What is f of b minus f of a over b minus a? This is equal to the slope. Um, and it's the slope of the line that's connected by the two endpoints of my graph. So if I draw an example here, uh, if I have something like this, my function looks like this. Okay, there's x equals a, here's x equals b. Notice my function, my green graph here, y equals f of x, is uh, continuous and differentiable uh, between a and b. But, but f of a doesn't equal f of b because f of a is lower um, below the x-axis and f of b is above the x-axis, so they're not the same values. But if I take this line that connects them here, this line here, um, the slope of that line equals the differences of the y over the differences of the x. And that is what we have here in um, the mean value theorem. So the derivative at some c is going to have the same value as the slope of the line that connects the two endpoints. Uh, and in this example, then, where, where is my c? Well, I want to find a c value between a and b so that if I drew the, the tangent line, it would have the same slope as the green line. Well, one of those lines would be this right there and so my c is going to be about there so down there and this is equal the derivative of c and that has same slope as the green line and uh, some of you would notice also notice that there's a second point i could have for c and that would be about here We'll call that C2. Um, and here, the derivative at C2 also equals um, same slope as green line. So in this case, we got two examples of C values. Just like Rolle's theorem, there's going to be at least one of them. 
but here we have um, two. So um, we're okay. Um, and that's what the that's what the mean value theorem says. So again, uh, in summary, the mean value says that there's some x equals c value. So it's the slope of the tangent line um, to y equals f of x at x equals c equals the slope of the line that connects the two endpoints. And how does this relate to, um, to Rolle's theorem? Well, in Rolle's theorem, um, so notice in Rolle's theorem, we have that third condition, f of b equals f of a. So um, substituting, putting this in to um, the mean value theorem, mean value theorem. And I'm going to abbreviate mean value theorem as MVT. We get, so the mean value theorem says there's going to be this C value between A and B, such that the derivative of C, uh, the derivative at C is F of B minus F of A over B minus A. But if we have that B equals A in Rolle's theorem, then this is going to be zero over B minus A which means equals zero. And then we have Rolle's theorem there. So Rolle's theorem is just a special case of the mean value theorem. All right, let's do an example with the mean value theorem then. Oh, you know, yeah, okay, let's do this example. Um, so this is similar to uh, what we did before. So we can, we're gonna have a function. We're gonna call this function one, uh, one over X, and we're gonna be on the interval from one to two. Um, and we're going to show F satisfies the conditions of, of the mean value theorem. And then we're going to find C from the mean value theorem. Okay. Well, I've got my function F of X equals one over X. Again, we're on one to two. Is uh, F, is it continuous on one to two? Well, yes. Where is F not continuous? It's not continuous at zero, right? Because you couldn't have zero in the denominator. But zero is not in the interval from one to two. So we're okay with that condition, all right? Is F differentiable? on the open interval from one to two. And again, yes, that's okay, because the only problem I would have would be at x equals zero, but that's not between one and two. Um, okay, so uh, so uh, the conditions for the mean value theorem are satisfied. Uh, okay, so let's find, um, find C from the mean value theorem. Okay, so to do that, we first need to find the derivative of our function. So what's the derivative of one over X? So uh, yeah, let me rewrite that. It'd be better for me to do it this way. I'll start with my function. So as a reminder, F of X is one over X. So what's the derivative? The derivative is then going to be um, I'm going to take the derivative d dx of x to the negative one power. All right. Now uh, let me write that a little bit nicer. Okay, so I'm doing d dx of x to the negative one power, and by the power rule, that's going to be negative one x to the negative two, which is negative one over x squared. Okay. So there's my derivative, and we also then that's the first thing we need to do. Second, we need to find f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay, that's the right side of the result in the mean value theorem. So I've got f of two minus f of one over two minus one. Well, let's see, what is f of two? Okay, f of two is one over two. Okay, so we're gonna get one half, uh, sorry, one, 
half here. And f of one is one over one, which is one. So we get one there. And so I now have this. And so on the top in the numerator here, I've got one half minus one, so that's minus one half. And in the denominator, I've got one, so I get negative one half. All right, so re recall, so um, the result of the mean value theorem is that there is a C value, an X equals C, where C is gonna be in this case, between one and two, such that the derivative at C equals this F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Well, we already figured out that that this is equal to negative one over C squared. Okay, and that comes from up here. All right, I've got negative one over X squared, I plug in, x equals c, and I get this value. And I also have for this, this comes up here. That was negative one half. So this is going to equal negative one half. OK, so maybe you don't like that in those different red, red and green colors there. So um, I don't know why. I just picked red and green, nice colors. So in essence, what I've got here, if I write this in black, I've got negative 1 over c squared equals negative one over two. Uh, so now if I simplify this, I can cross multiply, or, or some of you can just see that since the numerators are the same, I can set the denominators equal to each other. Either way, you'll end up with c squared equaling two. And then if I take the square root of, the, of both sides, I get c equals plus or minus the square root of two. Now I'm inside the interval. Um, remember that c, inside the interval from one to two, so C has to be between one and two. Um, so this tells me that C is going to be the square root of two, which is approximately like 1.4, which is definitely between one and two. Okay, but C is, um, is not going to equal uh, negative one half, negative square root of two, because that's not between one and two. So my answer is, this. Uh, let me just write it like that. And I write this part right here. Oops. Okay. There's my answer. C equals the square root of two on this problem. Now, what are some applications of, of um, the mean value theorem? Well, there's a cool application um, in CGI, computer graphic imagery here. So what what is that? Um, well, let me show you some uh, some examples here. Okay, uh, can I get this to? I'm getting my trying to do, trying to get my sharing up here. Okay, I guess I have to stop my share here and reshare this. Okay. All right. So here you should see an image of um, of a figure. And in computer graphic imagery, in CGI here, what we want to do is we want to take the figure on the left and we want to make it into an image that can be created by a computer. And what you do then is you go to the far right and you put on this triangulation of it. So you put on a grid on this character um, where you have these vertices and these line segments connecting these. And to move the character, then you can use parts of math called linear algebra, matrix, matrix theory, and you can put each of the, the intersection points of the triangularization of that character. Each of those represents a value in a matrix. And if you multiply that, take that those values and you multiply them by a matrix, you can move the character. Well, sometimes a character will have so many um, triangularization points on it that the calculations become really, really hard. And so what they did then in CGI is they thought it might be useful to try to reduce the number of, of triangular points. And one way you can do that, that's come up, um, I'll show you here in this character, this representation here, is that they would put like a, a, a mesh or a cage around the animated figure. 
So if they want to animate a horse here, they'll put this box or cage around it, and then they can put fewer number of points on the cage, so it would require fewer number of calculations to move it. You have, you have a fewer number of intersection points on the cage than you would on the original character. Um, but when you when you do this, just because you put the cage around the character, it doesn't mean that the character is going to move inside the box. When you move the box, there's no reason why um, that the, the character has to move um, it's and stay inside the box. In order to do that, you have to do some math, some math. You have to add on some math. And that math is doing is applying this idea of mean value coordinates. So you're using the mean value theorem here, or the idea of the mean value theorem to um, to put it so that so that when you move the cage or the box that is around the character, that the character will move inside the box um, in the same way, at the same time that you move the box. So the, so as you move the box, the character inside will move. And the, the reason for that is you've applied this mean value coordinates idea uh, to the character um, inside the box, and then it moves automatically. I think that's just really a cool, cool idea um, that you can use this mean value theorem um, in this application on computer graphics to move characters in a more efficient way because you have this box that requires fewer vertices and fewer points than does the number of boxes or number of um, vertices that you have on the character. And it's all possible in this case because of the mean value coordinates. All right, we just saw an example of how the mean value theorem can be used in computer graphics imaging um, to do moving animations. Now let's look at another uh, example of the mean value theorem, and we'll use this to prove something mathematically. So we're going to do this in a mathematical proof. All right, so here's my example. Show All right, we just saw how the mean value theorem can be used in the area of CGI and to move uh, characters, animated characters. Now we're going to do a second example or a second application of it, and this will be more in, in mathematics. So in this case, we're going to look at the following example. Show that the equation x to the fifth plus 10x plus 3 equals 0 has exactly, gosh, all right, we just saw an example of how the mean value theorem can be used in an application of CGI to help move animated characters. Let's now look at another example in a mathematical setting. So here's a second example in mathematics. And the example here will be to show that the equation x to the fifth plus 10x plus 3 equaling 0 has exactly one real solution. Okay. Now, when we say real solution, that means that there's going to be one value for x that we can put in there. Sometimes this is also talked about as having um, a root or a zero. So these are terms that could be put in for solution here. So sometimes you'll see a homework problem or a test problem will say, show that this has exactly one real root or one real zero, or it could even have this has one real solution. So what do we do here? Um, we have two parts here. Uh, part one is to show there is at least one solution. 
And then part two, show there cannot be two solutions. Now, if I've got one, at least one solution, but I can't have two solutions, that means that there is exactly one. So there's exactly one solution here. Uh, some of you may say, well, what about if I have three solutions? Um, if you have three solutions, then that means you're going to have two solutions also. And so uh, you can't have three solutions if you can't have two solutions. All right. So to do this, let's look at these two parts. So part one, again, we want to show that there's at least one solution. Um, we're going to use um, the intermediate value theorem. So we had talked about this uh, previously. The intermediate value theorem says that if I have a situation where I have a function that's continuous and I'm continuous on, at endpoints, so if we say x at a here, x equals a, x equals b, and this is y equals f of x. So um, we have f is continuous on a to b. And we're going to use a special case of this one here. And that special case, um, and if f of a is less than 0 and f of b is greater than 0, um, or vice versa. So you could have f of a greater than 0 or f of b, and then f of b less than 0. Then um, what do we get? The conclusion in the intermediate value theorem is that uh, there is some C where C is between A and B such that F of C equals zero. Okay, this is this is a, a, a variation of the intermediate value theorem, but this is the one most common one we've used. And you can see that in this case, my my value here is going to be, there's going to be my C value there. So if my function is continuous, and for one value of it, it's below the x-axis, and one value is above the x-axis, then there has to be some place where it crosses the x-axis. Um, that will show that there's at least one solution. If it crosses the x-axis, that's a solution to this. So what I need to do here is first define my function. So let's say define a continuous function, so I'm going to continue call f to be my x to the fifth plus 10x plus 3. And where does that come from? That comes from up here, that left-hand side of the equation. Okay, so there's my function. Um, and then we, um, we notice f is continuous. Um, on the whole set, on the whole real numbers from negative infinity to infinity, because it's a polynomial. And now I have to choose some a and some b where where f of a is going to be less than zero or greater than zero, and b f of b is going to be the opposite one. So one of them is going to be greater than zero, and one's going to be less than zero. Well, when I do this, uh, choosing zero is always a good one to do. So if I choose zero, then I'm going to get uh, zero to the fifth plus ten times zero plus three, which equals three. So that's greater than zero. So now I need to find a number um, that I plug in here so that it will be negative. I'm gonna choose negative one. And if I do that, I get negative one to the fifth plus 10 times negative one plus three. That's gonna be negative one minus 10 plus three. That's gonna be uh, negative eight and that's less than zero. Uh, so um, by the intermediate value theorem, IVT, there is at least one solution, um, which we'll call x equals c, where c is between negative 1 and 0. Um, and so we've got at least one solution. So that's part one. And again, we've talked about those types of problems. 
um, earlier in the course. Now, here's the new part, part two. Um, show there cannot be two solutions. All right, and we're gonna we're gonna use the mean value theorem, of course, because that's what, what section we're in. We're gonna use the mean value theorem and a proof by contradiction. We're gonna use the mean value theorem and proof by contradiction. So what's a proof by contradiction mean? Well, um, a, that means that you assume what you're trying to prove is not true, and then you show that, that this leads to a contradiction. So proof by contradiction is you, as, you assume what you're trying to prove is false, and then you follow the logical steps, and then you show that this leads to something that can't be true, um, and so then your original assumption must be false, uh, and that proves what you're trying to do, all right? Um, here's an example. Let me just give you a little example here of this idea. Um, suppose, suppose person A is a suspect in a crime. Uh, then a detective finds a photo of the suspect taken by a video camera at a store that's 50 miles away and is at the same time of the crime. Well, can that can that suspect suspect have done the deed? Could could that suspect really be the criminal? No, because he can't be. That suspect can't be in two places at once. Can't be at where the crime happened and be fifty miles away in the store where he was photo where he was photographed. So there's a contradiction. You assume that he's you assume that he's the suspect. But then you find some evidence that shows that he can't be the suspect because he was shown to be somewhere else at the same time and that the distance was too far apart for him to be at both places at the same time. All right. That's an idea of a proof by contradiction. OK, so I guess I don't need to write that there. Um, so what are we going to do in this case? So what we're going to do is um, we want to show um, that there is exactly one zero. So we want to show there is exactly one solution or zero or root. Um, and we're going to do proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume that this isn't true, that there isn't exactly one solution. Well, we already know that there's already at least one solution. And if there isn't exactly one, that means there has to be at least two. So we're going to assume um, that that uh, this that there see, there is not exactly one solution. And since again, like in part one, we already showed that there's at least one. Um, this means by part one, there has to be at least two solutions. Okay, so we're gonna, um, let's call, let's uh, call the two solutions. One of them we'll call A. So one is x equals a, and the other one is x equals b. Okay, so if it's a solution, what does that mean? That means uh, that f of a equals zero. And since b is a solution, f of b is zero. All right, so we're, again, we're, we're assuming that there is, that there is not exactly one solution. All right, we're going to do a proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume what we're we're going to assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that there's exactly one solution. So we're going to do a proof by contradiction and assume there's not exactly one solution. And since we part one, we proved that there is already one, at least one solution. That means then if there's not exactly one, there has to be at least two. And we're going to call these two solutions. One of them is going to be x equals a, and one's going to be x equals b. And if it's a solution, that means when I plug in x equals a to the to the function, I should get zero. And likewise, if b is a solution, that means f of b is zero. 
okay? Um, now, since F is a polynomial, uh, F is continuous. So since F is a polynomial, F is continuous on the interval from A to B, and it's differentiable on the open interval from A to B. Why do we need to do that? Because those are the hypothesis by the mean value theorem. In order to use the mean value theorem, then we have to do that. We have to show that those are true. So now we can say by the mean value theorem, there is a value x equals c, where c is between a and b, such that we get the conclusion of the mean value theorem, the derivative at c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. All right, there's a there's the conclusion of the mean value theorem. But what is f of f of b? Well, f of b is zero. So so we know that. And f of a is zero. So we plug those back in here and we get zero minus zero over b minus a, or we get zero. So there has this value c, when I take the derivative and I evaluate it c, then the value of it has to be zero. So f prime of c equals zero. Well, just like we've done with the other previous mean value theorems, um, let's compute f of c, the derivative of, of f. Okay, what's the derivative of f? Well, okay, again, uh, uh, let me do this. It would help to write this down. So remember, what is f? f of x is, in this case, was x to the fifth, plus 10x plus three. So now we're gonna compute the derivative. So the derivative is gonna be five x to the fourth plus 10. All right, so now there's gotta be a number, a real number that I can put in there for c, uh, c equals x, so that this, that five x to the fourth plus 10 evaluated at that c is gonna equal zero, okay? So uh, what, number for x equals c gives 5x plus 4, uh, 5x to the fourth plus 10 equals zero. Well, there is no number that does that, right? Because look what we have here. x to the fourth, that's the smallest that can be is zero. That can never be a negative number. But we also have this plus 10. So we've got a, a number that can never be negative. Um, that's either gonna be zero or larger and I'm adding 10 to it and I say it has to equal zero. Well, that's not possible. I can't have this, okay? This is not possible. You can't put in any number here for X so that you get five X to the fourth plus 10 is gonna equal zero, all right? Maybe another way to see that is um, you don't have to do this, but here, another way you could see that, if I brought the 10 to the other side, I would get this. And if I divide by five, that would give me x to the fourth um, is equal to negative two. What number can I put in that if I put it to the fourth power, I get negative two? You can't, there is no number that does that. This is not possible, okay, not possible. So, so what went wrong here? Well, it's, it's like that example I told you about uh, the suspect and he, suspect, he was a suspect to a crime, but then later they found a photo of him um, at a different site 50 miles away at the, that happened at the same time. So he couldn't be a suspect. So what does that mean? That means that, that he can't be a suspect. So the original assumption that he was a suspect was not true. That same thing applies here. So that means the original assumption is false. And what was the original assumption? Uh, that is, um, the original assumption was that we had two roots here. So we cannot, or two solutions, we cannot have two solutions. All right, so 
there's our proof. We showed in part one that there has to be at least one solution. And in part two, we showed that you can't have two solutions. Therefore, um, there must be exactly one solution. Exactly one solution. So here's another example of an application of the mean value theorem. All right, hope that helps you. Uh, have a great day.